So today is traditionally what is known as Palm Sunday in the church. It is the Sunday before Easter that uh, in the Christian church we celebrate as Palm Sunday. It's the Sunday that it's the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem while people were laying their palm branches on the ground, uh, saying Hosanna, God save us. Um, we're not going to talk about that this morning because we already talked about it back in November. Uh, in, the series, in this series called The Jesus Story. And so if you want to hear a sermon about uh, Palm Sunday, it's week 23. You can go back and on the, our YouTube channel uh, or on the uh, Church Center app and uh, find those. If you want to just binge watch the whole Jesus uh, Story series, it's about 20 hours worth of sermons that you could catch up on. So it's probably much better than any Netflix show you could uh, catch up on. But... Um, but y'all know, if today's Palm Sunday, that means next week is Easter. Easter. That's right. And so, um, and let me just tell you, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be an amazing Sunday. Uh, I got my suit picked out already. Uh, I'm serious. I'm wearing a suit next week. Y'all better watch out. I'm getting ready. Um, I hope you got your, uh, your, your dresses and your pastel shirts and your, your pretty hats uh, ready to go. Uh, but, um, but we're going to talk about that next week. Today... We're going to talk about the cross, uh, and, it's, and let me just tell you, for the next 40 minutes or so, it's going to be intense, all right? Um, but we can't experience the joy of the resurrection without the pain of the cross. And so, just for a moment, I want you to place yourself 2,000 years ago. Uh, Jesus is in the courtyard of Caiaphas, the high priest, uh, and you are an innocent spectator in the crowd and you're in the courtroom but the difference is you know you know the story you know the future you know who it is standing in the middle of the courtyard and you know why he's really there you know he's there for you you know Why? So just for a second, place yourself there. You've just witnessed Jesus being arrested. You're in the courtyard. You just saw him be, to be, be slapped for telling the truth. You watch him take it. And I think if we periodically place ourselves at the penalty of the crime that we committed, it will change our perspective on what we're about to talk about. Because I think many times we overlook this event and we look upon it as, thank you, Jesus, and we should, right? But if we don't truly understand, if we don't truly put ourselves in the place, in the courtroom of the guy on trial because you committed the crime, and you know that he's up there for you, it changes our perspective. So let's go to John chapter 18. I'm going to start in verse 28 where we left off last week. It says, Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early in the morning, so Jesus had been up all night. And to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. So Paul's right there. I find a, a couple things um, um, that, that stick out to me right there. Number one, the first thing is, uh, these religious leaders, these Jewish leaders that had Jesus arrested were really concerned about their man-made laws. So much so, they wouldn't even go into Pilate's palace because they were scared that they wouldn't be able to eat the Passover meal because they would be unclean. But notice in there, they never really said what charges they're actually bringing against Jesus. They never even said, he said, well, if he wasn't a criminal, 
we wouldn't bring him to you. There were no charges stated in there. And so they're preparing for Passover and they're so worried about the Passover that they forget the other Ten Commandments. Right? How about, how about this one? No other gods before me. Uh, they're, they're breaking that commandment. Or um, how about not taking the Lord's name in vain? There's another commandment they're breaking. Or how about just a simple one? Don't murder. Right? I mean, they know Jesus hasn't done anything. They know he's not a criminal. But they for, conveniently forget all of that. But, but let, let's look at the following verses. Because this tells us that Pilate already knew who Jesus was. Like Pilate was in charge. He was the governor of the, of the region. And so he knew what was going on. So he had heard about Jesus. So look what he says. Pilate went back inside of the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Now, here's the thing. Do you, do you see the authority Jesus is talking to? Like, this is not, I think this would be like you're standing in front of the judge, right? And most of the time when you, maybe some of y'all haven't stood in front of a judge before, but <laughs> you, you address the judge as your honor. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. You address the judge with honor. And Jesus is speaking to the judge with authority because he knows the authority that's been given to him by God the Father. And when you've been given authority by God the Father, you don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to defend yourself. And so Jesus said this in verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to, pre to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Verse 38, what is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Now, verse 38 right there, Pilate asked the question that's still asked today, right? What is truth? What is truth? I, like, Jesus had already answered this back in chapter 14. Y'all know that verse? When Jesus said what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. But, but here's the thing. We don't really like that answer because it only leaves a single way, a single truth, and a single life. But Jesus was clear. That's what it is. You see, because there is no my truth. There is no your truth. It is only the truth, and that is Jesus and what he says. And all truth is based upon the person and the work of Jesus. And so Pilate walks out to the people. He says, I've talked to him. I've questioned him. I don't, I don't see anything. I don't see anything that he's done. And, and this is not the first time that he, he has this exchange seven times between Jesus and then he goes back to the people. And he goes to Jesus and he goes back to the people. And it happens seven times. And and, and if you know, uh, the, in the Bible, the, the number seven is the number of completion. And so it's, 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 it's completing the whole uh, picture here. That Pilate thinks Jesus is innocent. But what I find, and that we know, even though he thinks he's innocent, he still condemns him to die. You know why? Because he's scared. He's fearful of man, and he's scared that he'll lose his status. Self-preservation. He's scared of what people might think. And the spirit of fear overcomes Pilate. It overcomes him. And he doesn't have the backbone to surrender to Jesus. Matthew 27, which is the same um, account that we're reading out of John, it actually says this. It says, what shall I do then with Jesus 
who is called the Messiah. That is the same question that you have to answer too. What will you do with Jesus, who is called Messiah? Back to John, verse 39. It says, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now, Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. So what Pilate was doing here was he was attempting to take the easy way out. And he was hoping, and I think he was just praying and just just wanting uh, the people to say, okay, you've done your part. Yeah, go ahead, release him. Or them not have another option. And he would say, you, you, re- you want me to release a prisoner? I'll give you Jesus. And to his surprise, they release Barabbas. They want Barabbas. Now, we know <clears throat> Barabbas was a thief. Barabbas was a murderer. Uh, he was a... Um, His actual name was uh, Jesus Barabbas. And so the word Jesus means Savior, and then uh, Barabbas means Son of the Father. And so so what they were in their minds, in these Jewish people's mind, they're thinking if we can release this guy who started a revolt to kill Romans, to overthrow the Roman government, we're going to release our Savior. (laughs) Boy, did they have it backwards. (laughs) And so they're thinking, if we can get this guy out, he's going to help us. But do you understand the thief goes free while the Savior dies? Barabbas, son of the father, was released in place of son of the father. What I want us to understand is that we are Barabbas. You get freedom because Jesus didn't. Have you you really thought about that? Remember, you're in the courtroom. You're in the crowd and you're hearing these other people scream Barabbas. Maybe you're even screaming Barabbas too. But you know the person that they're about to execute is there because of you. And you get to walk out of there and he doesn't. We are Barabbas. Chapter 19. Now, I think um, until the movie Passion of the Christ, I don't think, I don't know that we fully grasped this uh, next scene. And if you haven't seen that movie, you, you probably should uh, eventually. Um, it's rated R, so if you have um, that, that rule in your house, you can't watch rated R movies, you probably can't watch this one. But, uh, but, um, but the reason it's rated R is because of the depiction of the crucifixion. Um, and so the Romans had, uh, perf- uh, they had mastered and perfected crucifixion. And so what Pilate did is he had Jesus ordered, he he had him ordered to be flogged. And so what flogging was is they would tie the prisoner up to a post and the the soldiers would have what was called a cat of nine tails. And so it's like a whip and on the end of it, it's got nine tails. And on each one, there would be uh, shards of glass and shards of rocks and uh, and metal and all these things uh, on the end. And so when they whipped them and they pull the cat of nine tails back, it would pull skin off. Josephus, who is a, uh, his, um, who's a historian, is a first century historian, actually says that many times when they flogged people, there would be pieces of rib, bone, and flesh that would fly out into the congregation of the crowd around. 
Uh, the Bible says that he was beaten so badly he was barely recognizable as a human being. It was tough. Chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. They're making fun of him, right? Now, these thorns were not like we experience maybe some briar patch thorns here in the great state of Georgia. If you um, ever get the opportunity to go to Israel with me, um, they will show you what these thorns actually look like because they're still there. They're usually caught up in what's called an acacia tree or around acacia wood. And many of the thorns are probably three, four, five, some six inches long. And they fashion this out, this, this circle out of, out of these thorns and pressed it down on Jesus' head. Many believe that the thorns dug so far into his head that they dug all the way to his um, bone in his head, around his head, into his skull. Um, excruciating, all while they're making fun of him and slapping him. Verse 4, once more Pilate came out and said, to the Jews gathered there, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. <laughs> now, just for a second, think about being Pilate in that moment. Because he's, he's no doubt, as he's, sent, as he's coming out, uh, out of the palace onto his little courtyard there, and he's probably overlooking many of the, of, of the, the Jewish people there. Um, and there's like a judgment seat right over here that we're going to talk about in just a second. But, um, but, but he's looking there, and Jesus is standing there right next to him. And he says, here is the man. Pilate was really close to the man along with all his cabinet, like his administrators. And as I spoke about last week, my fear for us is that we're, we're really close to the man and we miss the man. We see all he's done, we witness it, we testify to it, but we miss him because we're just like Pilate and we're not willing to surrender to what we know to be true because we're scared and fearful of man. Verse six, as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw it, they shouted, crucify, crucify, which I would imagine probably, probably took Pilate back a little bit. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. In the other gospel accounts, that's where we, we see that he actually looks at him and he says, I wash my hands of this man's blood. But here's the thing. Fear kept Pilate he said he was even more afraid. Fear kept Pilate out of heaven. Fear. That same fear can keep you out of heaven too. If you're fearful of what someone else will think, if you're fearful of surrendering to Jesus... It will keep you out of heaven. Just like Pilate. Everything was right in front. He believed Jesus was who he said he was. He found no basis for the charges that they brought. He said he was innocent. In verse 9, he went back in the, inside the palace. <laughs> Where do you come from, right? Can, can, can y'all hear like, who are you? 
he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And I love this because I could imagine Jesus was kind of like over there, like just kind of humbly standing right where he needs to stand, right? And he comes back in and Pilate says that and he kind of peeks up and looks at Pilate. Just with that, uh, maybe a little smirk on his face. And he says this, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. Verse 12, from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be king opposes Caesar. But when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat, Jesus out and sat down on the, ju- uh, the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which is Aramaic for Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Now, here's what I find funny. You want to talk about blasphemy. (laughs) So for them, what they're actually saying, Jews had a a saying saying that that God was, was king, right? And Jesus was saying, I'm king of the Jews, meaning he's saying, I'm God. The Romans had a saying, Caesar is king. Caesar is Lord. So when they say we have no king but Caesar, they are declaring and pronouncing that Caesar is their Lord. Once again, Ten Commandments, they're just throwing them out the window. To heck with those things, right? All we care about is our agenda. But remember, all these people, it's Palm Sunday, right? All these people that are standing there shouting crucify, Some five days before that, we're saying, Hosanna, Lord, save us. The problem that what they were more focused on the us as opposed to the Lord. How could they do this? Right? We're standing there in the crowd. We're wondering if they only knew. But yet, Many of us, unfortunately, we do the same today, don't we? We, Here on Sunday, we throw up our hands, praise Him again and again, and by Friday, we're really ticked at God because He didn't give us what we wanted that week. When I say we're not far off from the people that were in the crowd, we're not far off. Verse 16, finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. Now, um, as I was studying this, one thing I thought that was, um, this is kind of going off off topic, but I wanted to mention it um, because I I think God really impressioned upon my heart. We know that uh, Joseph carried his cross some of the way for him. And in one of the gospels, it lists his name, which means uh, his, miss his name and his kids there, which means more than likely his, his kids were with him. And so um, you, you, what really stuck out as I was studying for this is um, as parents, are your kids going to be able to say you carried the cross? We'll go back to this. That's maybe for a later date. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is Golgotha. There... They crucified him with uh, two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Now, I have a picture that I took in uh, Israel. That's Golgotha, the place of the skull. The reason why it's called that is because it looks like a skull. Can you pick out the, the, there's different parts, actually. There's another kind of, if you kept panning to the right, which we can't, there's another place that kind of looks like a skull, but it kind of looks like a, a funny skull. He's got some bangs that hang over, some green bangs that hang over his two eyes. Uh, And then he's got a nose there with a little puffy thing and then a mouth underneath it. 
Um, but that's why it looked like a skull. That's why they called it the place of the skull. I've got it circled. If you can't picture it, there it is. Um, and so the funny thing about this now, just above that is a Muslim cemetery now. And just below that, uh, you can almost see the top of one just at the very bottom of the screen. It's a bus station. So it smells like carbon monoxide when you're sitting there. You sit right here, there's a little, you can see the, uh, uh, the mirror there or the, the glass there so you don't fall over into the bus station because you're able to actually get up and kind of stand there. Um, but that's where they, um, where they think, they don't know for 100% sure, but that's where they think uh, that Jesus was crucified. Uh, but here's the thing, what I would tell you is what's different from maybe what we think about that is Jesus was not up on top of that, he was actually down at eye level on the ground. Uh, and so there's a main thoroughfare road that runs right along there. And then the, the, uh, the, the wall of the city is just across the street from that. And so that was a main road that ran uh, outside of town. And so it would have been a main thoroughfare through there. And so, uh, so Romans who were very good at crucifixion did not want to crucify you up on top of a mountain where no one would see you. They wanted everyone to see it. So you knew that if you messed up, that's where you were headed. And so it was at eye level. He was probably only about maybe a foot or two off the ground. And so what would happen, um, they would take spikes and uh, some eight to 10 inches long, kind of like a railroad spike that we know today. And they would nail it just above the carpal bones in the wrist right here uh, on both sides stretched out like this, and then they would do the same with a spike. They would cross your feet, do the same with a spike, and nail it right through the top of your foot, through the back of your heel, into the wood behind you. Many times, um, what they would also do is they'd put a little seat right here so you could sit down on, and this is going to sound bad, they would also nail your private parts to that as well. And so um, it was very gruesome. It was very gross. You would be naked on the cross. Not very many women uh, ever were crucified because of just the gruesome nature of what was going on. Um, and so, um, and the way that um, it was excruciating, it's where we get that word from. Crucifixion is where we get the word excruciating from. And so what would happen would be you would uh, lean down on your arms, your arms would go up and you try to sit down and you get some rest. But you couldn't breathe when you did that because your lungs would fill with blood and water. So you'd have to push up. Extending yourself off the seat you were on, trying to give some relief to your lungs so you could get air. This is what Jesus was going through in that moment. Verse 19. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Remember, there's a whole bunch of people there for Passover. So he wanted to make sure everybody knew what was written up there. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, don't write king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, I have written, uh, what I have written, I have written. Because Pilate knew. I think it's proof that he actually knew and I think he actually thought and he believed that Jesus was who he said he was. He just never surrendered to it. So Jesus is on the cross. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares. One for each of them. With the undergarment remaining, the garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Now, this is Psalm 22. Uh, what, What David wrote in Psalm 22 is detailed of what's going on here. As a matter of fact, Psalm 22, it is a detailed uh, explanation of crucifixion. This is what it says is going to happen. 
There's so many other texts in the Old Testament. Did you know (laughs) that the Bible is the only religious affiliated text where the prophecies have actually come true? No other religious affiliated text has ever prophesied anything that has actually come true. The Bible is the only one. You know why? Because this is true. It's real. (laughs) Verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. That's a lot of Marys in one place. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, who was John, the author of this book, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Now imagine you're standing there and still there, and you're witnessing it and you're seeing it. And you look over and you see Mary, the mother of Jesus. There ain't no pain like kid pain. And I imagine she's distraught because there's no way out of this, right? I mean, this is, he's in the middle of it. And she knew, right? Y'all know that Christmas song, Mary, did you know? Yes, she knew. She knew this day was coming. She understood what was happening. From the time that, that the angel visited her in Nazareth and told her that he will die for the sins of the world. He will be the Savior. But it couldn't lessen the pain. Because there's no pain like kid pain. In that moment, think about this. Jesus was quite busy at the time, right? (laughs) He was quite busy dying. And he looks down at his mother and pauses. And he cares for her. He looks at John and he says, take care of her. You know, I think many times we don't take our problems to God because we think he's busy. And what I would tell you is Jesus cares for those he cares for. He's never too busy to take care of you. He's never too busy to hear you, to care for you. Verse 28, later knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they, they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. Now before we, we think, oh, that's, that's nice of the soldiers. They gave him a little something to drink. Um, we, we need to quite understand what this sponge was. It's called a tessorium. There's other names for it that aren't appropriate to say in church. <laughs> but a tessorium was a sponge that Roman soldier carried around with him when he had to go he would dip it in some wine vinegar and clean himself with it many historians believe one of the soldiers pulled this out of his sack and dipped it in some we don't know if it was what it was exactly most people think it was a, an alcoholic beverage that they drank They dipped his dirty toilet paper in there and raised it up to Jesus to drink. (laughs) So they're not really giving him something to take the edge off. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, 
he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That word, it is finished, is the word to die. And it's a banking term that means paid in full. It means complete. It means done. It means the final payment has been made. Y'all ever paid off something? <laughs> Man, that's a good feeling, isn't it? In that moment, when Jesus cried out to tell us die, your debt was paid. Your sin was paid. You see, sin is not some moral thing that we failed to do. And it's not really some just immoral thing that we did. It's much more than that. I love what John Piper says. He says, he says this. He says, what is sin? It is the glory of God not honored, the holiness of God not referenced, reverenced, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored, the faithfulness of God not trusted, the commandments of God not obeyed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, the person of God not loved. That is sin. And that is what Jesus was conquering and defeating as he cries out to tell us die. It is finished. He made all of that right and paid for all of that on our behalf. So we didn't have to. Verse 31, now it was the day of preparation and the next day was a special Sabbath because, of the, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then the other. The reason they broke the legs is because when your legs are broken, you can't push up to get air. Therefore, you suffocate on your own blood quicker. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they took on the one they have pierced. Now, this is the pivotal moment in all of human history. When Jesus dies, gives up his spirit, willfully gives up his spirit. I love what another translation says, he gave up his ghost. If, if I can make one plea with you guys this week, the beginning of Holy Week, right? Let's don't chalk this up to just, oh yeah, that's the Easter story. Yeah, I heard that last year. Because this was the pivotal moment for your life. Without this moment, that's you on the cross. You see, Jesus didn't just die for you. He died instead of you. Every moment 
in all of human history points to this one. The entire Old Testament points to right here. The entire New Testament and beyond points to right here. Your entire life points to right here, whether you've surrendered or not. Let's don't be numb to this just because it's the Easter story and we've heard it before. This was the moment when Jesus cried out, it is finished to tell us die, paid in full. Let me ask you this, and I'm ending, I promise. Hmm. You can't gloss over this. <laughs> when you see a cross, what do you see? What do you see? Do you see some nice like ornament that maybe hangs on the on the wall? Maybe you give it as a gift, right? Housewarming gift. Is it a necklace? That's a that's a pretty necklace. Oh, it's got some it's got a diamond in it. That's that's nice, All right? Maybe, maybe, I know the kind of crowd I'm talking to. Maybe, maybe it's a cool tattoo, right? <clears throat> Let me encourage you. When you see a cross, look at it and say, that was for me. That was for me. You see, the execution of God's Son was ultimately the execution of God's plan. Now, the biggest question you have to ask when you see a cross is this. Do you believe it counted for you? Do you actually believe that it was for you? You see, because God's plan, it didn't stop at the cross. It didn't stop at the empty grave. It didn't stop at Jesus going back to, to heaven. It didn't stop with him sending his Holy Spirit. God's plan included you hearing this message today. And I think... I think there's people here that you've been, you've been waiting. You've been putting it off. I'll do it next time. Yeah, maybe next week, right? What, what a, no, no better day. Easter Sunday, right? No. Right now is no better day. Right now. Right now. The Savior of the world cries out, paid in full for you. Don't put it off anymore. Surrender to Jesus right now. Father, this morning, I pray for those here. I know there's people here in this room or watching online that Father, they need to surrender their life to you in this moment. They need to believe that when you cried out, it is finished, to tell us die, that it counted for them. Father, right now, I pray for those that need to say this. Jesus, thank you. And if that's you and you need to surrender your life, just just cry out to him. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, for paying my debt in full. Because I couldn't. And because you did that for me, I'm surrendering my life to you.
I'm not putting this off anymore. I'm not waiting around. So Father, today, just cry out to him and say, Father, I surrender my heart and my life to you. Jesus, come in and be my Savior. Father God, we thank you for sending your Son to pay it all for us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, amen.